This is part two in a series. The last time I was preaching, we had part one on the meaning of fire in Scripture. Uh, and I told you it started out with a seminary assignment uh, and expanded out into uh, a very moving learning experience for me. Uh, many questions I'd had got answers, or partial answers at least, uh, that I have treasured ever since. Uh, last time, uh, we had point one, the fire that consumes and destroys is eternal because God's glorious presence is eternal. <clears throat> uh, it, in, in scripture, uh, it talks about where Jesus says the wicked will be burned with everlasting fire. Uh, and there have been times when I wished he hadn't phrased it that way. <laughs> Because it makes it challenging for Adventist pastors who know that uh, you don't burn forever if you're lost. Why did he say it's everlasting fire? Well, it turns out that fire in Scripture often is talking about the glory of God's presence. God doesn't go away. The glory of his presence doesn't go away. The fire of the glory of his presence doesn't go away. It's eternal as he is eternal. It has a, a limited time for the, for the wicked to burn, but the fire goes on because it's God's eternal presence that it's connected to. That helped me quite a little with, with that passage. Uh, today, we're going to look at fire in Revelation uh, and uh, learn a bit more about what the Bible has to say about fire. Let's take a moment and uh, have a word of prayer. Lord, as we look into your word, we ask that you would open our hearts to hear it and to understand it and to grasp the meaning that you have put there for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, fire shows up all over in the book of Revelation. In the very first part, there's the description of Jesus. Uh, and he is standing among the seven lampstands. There's fire. He has eyes of fire. He has feet glowing like they are burning in a furnace. Uh, he has seven stars in his right hand. And his countenance is like the sun. Do you get the hint that he's kind of fiery? <laughs> Distinctly so. Intentionally so. Uh, kind of a, a footnote. One of the things that may be saying is he is fully divine. He's as glorious and as fiery as the Father himself. Uh, Revelation 1, uh, Revelation 2, Revelation 10, Revelation 19, the descriptions of Jesus have these elements that, that repeat, the, the elements referring to fire. In chapters 4 and 5, we have the heavenly throne room scene. And the glory of God's physical presence is spoken of there as well as the seven lamps of fire, which in that context, are, it says, are the Holy Spirit. Uh, in chapters 8 and 9, we have the seven trumpets. The first part of chapter 8, verses 1 to 6, is a prelude to those seven trumpets. There's an angel there with a censer with fire, and he offers that incense with the prayers of the saints. By the way, uh, what does incense going up with the prayers of the saints signify? Well, incense is a sweet-smelling smoke, right? Without the sweet smell, you would have just the smoke. So I think our prayers without Jesus' righteousness is the smoke. We kind of need his righteousness with the prayer to make it a pleasant thing. Otherwise, smoke in the nostrils. You've been to sitting around a campfire? The wind blows it to your side like it does to me all the time. If I move, it follows me around. Uh, and I come home smelling like fire and my eyes are stinging. And it's not a very pleasant thing. And there's places where God says, who requires you to bring all this sacrifices and offerings? It's smoke in my nostrils. <laughs> Please. If it comes without faith, and without the righteousness of Christ, it's just smoke. If it comes with the righteousness of Christ, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, 
my parents were missionaries in, in the Far East. I went to Academy in Singapore. And, and incense is used all over the Far East. And I got back to the States. I liked incense, except in those days, this was in the uh, early 70s, that you're burning incense in there. They thought you're doing other things you shouldn't be doing. And so I didn't burn incense just because I didn't want to be misunderstood. But I like the smell of incense. It's a, it's a pleasant thing. So the, the first, that same angel, sorry, he fills his censer with fire off the altar of, of, burnt, of incense. He, he takes that same fire, puts it in his, in his incense, in his censer, sorry. Uh, it says, then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And what follows are the seven trumpets and all of the judgments that, that fall because of those trumpets. Now, I, I, for a long time, I couldn't figure out this thing about the censer and the fire and the angel at the altar. Because he offers the incense with the prayers and then he throws it to the earth and his disasters. I mean, is this a good thing or this a bad thing? In, in my mind, I like to have it in one category or the other. Most things in my life, I, I want them to be black, I want them to be white, give me what it is, is this a good thing, is this a bad thing? And here was one that I couldn't figure out because it had elements of both in it. And like, what is this? What is this? Uh, as we go along today, I hope you pick up on, on how that might be. That the same sensor and the same fire can be a blessing when it goes up with the prayers of the saints, and it can bring, bring destruction when it's cast to the earth. Uh, and and we'll, we'll look at that a little more. Fire is connected with every one of the seven trumpets. If you look through them, they all have some element of fire in there. Uh, if, if not directly, at least indirectly. Uh, and so the trumpets are judgments. Uh, trumpets were often used in ancient days as a warning of attack from the enemy. And so these are warnings that God has given to his people. Uh, and it, it, it turns out it's because his people are not being faithful. Now, in the Old Testament, they weren't faithful and judgments came to them. And it turns out during the history of the church after the time of Jesus, the church also has had a hard time being faithful to God, uh, which when we read the whole Bible together, we're not shocked by that. Uh, we kind of recognize, oh, we're still doing our old thing like we did back in the Old Testament, aren't we? Uh, and so God sends warnings of judgment to his people, as well as the judgments to try to correct them, bring them back to himself. As in the book of Judges, uh, there would be times when God he says he sold them to their enemies uh, and uh, they would oppress them for a time. So the first trumpet sounds, and there is hail with blood and fire. Uh, and, it, the, and a third of the trees were burned up, uh, and all green, green grass was burned up. Then the second trumpet sounds, and something like a great burning mountain with fire was thrown into the sea. And it says a third of the creatures in the sea died, a third of the ships were destroyed. The uh, third trumpet falls, a, a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. And, oh, sorry. And, and a third of the water, it fell on the rivers uh, and springs, and a third of the water became bitter. Uh, the fourth trumpet uh, sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, as well as a third of the moon and the stars. The fifth trumpet was sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. Uh, and locusts come out in that smoke, and they represent the armies uh, of those who uh, were attacking Christianity at the time. The sixth trumpet describes the horses of that army. It says, and the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, 
And out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. Now that fire and brimstone thing again there. Now this time it's not from God. It's from the enemies that God turns loose on his people because of their unfaithfulness. Seventh trumpet sounds. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven. The ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And presumably his glorious presence as well. Uh, and, and there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquake, and great hail. Notice the lightnings. We still have that, that fire theme following through, even into the seventh trumpet. Now, a little earlier in chapter 11, there was an interlude about the two witnesses. And of them it says, And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. It's probably an allusion to the occasion when Elijah called down fire on the guys who were sent out to take him prisoner uh, and haul him in uh, before the king. Uh, and uh, the first batch was incinerated, and the second batch was incinerated. And the third guy says to his guys, stay here. And he goes up and he says, please, have mercy on us. <laughs> we don't want to burn up like the other guys. Would, would you mind coming with us? And he says, I'll go with you. Uh, and that time, they didn't burn up. Uh, this fire comes out and devours the enemies. Um, then in Revelation 14, jumping over a few chapters, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. There is fire of uh, torment for the wicked. That's chapter 14. Now, if we move just a few more verses to the beginning of chapter 15, where we read for our scripture reading today, it turns out to be a very interesting spot. Looking back to chapter 4, there was the throne room scene. And it said, before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. So what was in front of the throne in chapter 4? A sea of glass. Okay. When God's people come into his presence, before his throne, they find out that's where the sea of glass is, in front of God's throne. I'm looking forward to the day when we are there to stand on that sea. That'll be the day. When you're standing on the sea of glass... You have arrived. Amen. It's all good now. And the past doesn't matter anymore. That's a really good moment, standing on the sea of glass. Revelation 20, we have a description of the final destruction of sin and sinners. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Uh, and in the context, it's before the great white throne. And God is sitting on that great white throne. And in front of God's throne, when the wicked come into his presence, what do they find? A lake of fire. A lake of fire. When the righteous come into his presence, they find a sea of glass. When the wicked come into his presence, they find a lake of fire. Continuing in here in, in Revelation 15. Uh, here in the center uh, of Revelation, John says, And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. Well, which is it? Yes, it's both. To the righteous is a sea of glass. To the wicked is a lake of fire. But it is the sea of glass mingled with fire. It's the same sea of glass slash fire. And, and, and I would propose that the sea doesn't change. The sea doesn't change. It's the people who come into God's presence that are different. That's where the difference is. 
For the righteous, it's a sea of glass. For the wicked, it's the lake of fire. And those two are inseparably mingled together. John says, I saw the sea of glass mingled with fire. It's how each group will experience the sea when they come into God's glorious presence. Continuing on, next verse. And those who have gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God, this is where we plan to be. Having the harps of God, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, and we're going to get some of the words of that song in just a second here, but notice that we're taking words for the song of Moses as well as the song of the Lamb. We'll look at the song of Moses in just a minute here. Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. So one of the things that the song focuses on is God's marvelous works. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. He is just. He's holy. His marvelous works. For all nations shall come and worship before you. For your judgments have been manifested. So this sea involves God's judgments. Uh, as well as praise to him for his marvelous works, his holiness, his goodness. The song of Moses. You've heard of that before in scripture, right? Where does that come from? Well, that comes from uh, Exodus 15. Uh, the exodus of Israel from Egypt when they got to the Red Sea and passed through the Red Sea safely. And the sea closed on their pursuers and destroyed them on the far shore of the sea. When they were safely out of the sea and out of the reach of the Egyptian army, the Israelites sang the song of Moses on the shore of the sea. And some of the words in that song, uh, yeah, boy, my mind blanks out on me at the wrong moments. Exodus chapter 15. Uh, the, the women led in the singing along with Miriam. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. This is Revelation 15, 1 and following. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. Uh, and it continues on uh, quite a little bit. Uh, what has happened? God has just delivered the Israelites from their pursuers by the experience of the Red Sea, right? Okay, so it's a song of, of victory, but it's a song of God's intervention to deliver from the pursuers who were trying to destroy us. That's the image of, of the Red Sea. Now we take that over to the sea of glass slash sea of fire. Uh, and what does it say? Well, it says that if you, if you get the same elements happening at that sea, God's people have just been delivered uh, from their pursuers. They have been delivered by this sea. And this sea has destroyed their pursuers. So when Jesus comes, what is it that destroys the wicked? The glory of God, the glory of his presence, a consuming fire. And so the sea of glass mingled with fire delivers God's people and destroys their enemies again, as with the Red Sea. Uh, it has those same elements in it in, in Revelation 15. Israel passes through safely uh, and their pursuers are destroyed trying to chase them down. Uh, what's with this Pharaoh guy anyway? I mean, how slow is he a learner? He've had 10 plagues in a row. And after the 10th plague, he says, get out and don't come back. And the rest of the Egyptians say, or we're all dead. 
because the conclusion was pretty obvious that God has been tightening the screws with each succeeding plague. It's gotten harder and closer and harder and closer. And when you take out all the firstborn on plague number 10, if you've got another plague on after that, what comes next? It's the rest of us are dead. It was pretty clear logic. The Egyptians get that. Pharaoh can lose sight of that, but the rest of the Egyptians got that. They need to go. You need to let them go. We need to have them go. They need to go, or we're all dead. And they said that, or we're all dead. Uh, and yet, a few days later, and Pharaoh says, we need our servants back. Let's go get them. Like, you don't remember any of the ten plagues? So they go after him. And, and they got them cornered by the Red Sea. Uh, Ellen White's description says there's a mountain in front of them, there's a mountain beside them, the Egyptian army is behind them, and the sea's on the other side. They got nowhere they can escape, nowhere. There's no getting out. And in the middle of the night, they take off because the sea opened up. Pharaoh and his guys hear them moving and say, don't let them get away, let's chase them down. I don't think they knew they were going into the middle of the sea. I think they were just following the sound of the retreating Israelites. And in the middle of the night, in the middle of the sea, that pillar of cloud and fire, all night long it's been a pillar of fire on the Israelite side and a pillar of cloud on the Egyptian side. It's been dark. And the Egyptians really didn't want to go into that thing. Hey, we'll just camp here and go after them tomorrow, right? But in the middle of the night, they're chasing them down. They get out of the middle of the sea, and the light comes on on their side. And here you are, out in the middle of the sea, with walls of water on both sides of you. And Israel's God's done that. And you're out in the middle, and it doesn't look good. It really doesn't look good. And they decide, you know, we might should go back. So they turn to go back. And what was dry land for the Israelites goes mushy. Their wheels don't work right. Maybe even start falling off. In any case, the chariots don't work. They're, they're stranded out in the middle and water comes back over. That's it. Uh, Israel was delivered and their pursuers were destroyed by that same sea. And that's the image that carries over into Revelation 15. The sea that is a blessing and a deliverance to God's people was a destruction to their pursuers. Uh, the song they sang, God has intervened. God has delivered us. He has destroyed our enemies. It's interesting that there is a a traditional story among the Jewish rabbis about this moment. So this is Jewish rabbis talking about the experience on the shore of the Red Sea. And they say that in heaven the angels said to God, shall we sing too? When the Israelites are praising him for their deliverance. And God says, no. The other ones were my children too. And that's from the lips of Jewish rabbis who usually didn't think very highly of the people around them, but they caught the heart of God on that one. Where God says, no, no. Those were my children too. We're all God's children. And he wants all of us with him in heaven. He doesn't want any of us out. He wants all of us in. And, and uh, he will do what needs to be done. If we'll cooperate with him, he'll accomplish that. Um, so, as it was at the Red Sea in Exodus, so it is here in Revelation. There is the song of deliverance, and the same sea delivers God's people and destroys their enemies. That's the song of Moses. It also talks about the song of the Lamb. Uh, and... and the, the first connection that comes to mind here is back to the Exodus. Was there a lamb involved there? Oh, absolutely there was. Which lamb was that? Passover lamb. 
Uh, you put the blood on the doorposts, and the destroying angel passes over your house, and your firstborn doesn't die. That same Passover experience that was deliverance by faith in the blood for the Israelites was destruction to those who did not believe uh, and chose not to follow what God said. Uh, there's more to the Song of the Lamb. We're going to come back to that in one of the future sessions. Session four, we'll, we'll, we'll dig into it deeper. Uh, that's deep enough for this morning, right here. So for both seas, there's deliverance for the righteous and destruction for their pursuers. The same sea, and here in Revelation, it's the sea with fire. The same fire delivers God's people and destroys their pursuers. And so we can see that what is a sea of glass for the righteous is a lake of fire for the wicked. Uh, and it is the sea of glass mingled with fire, as John describes it there. Now we see that same kind of pairing of positive and negative experiences of fire in other places in Scripture. Moses goes up on the mountain, uh, and the same fire that the people were scared of, he goes in and comes back out glowing. He's all right in there. But the people were terrified that they would be destroyed by that fire, and indeed they might have been. Uh, they, they had the sense not to go in there. Uh, by the way, when Moses went up the mountain, he did not immediately go into God's presence. He spent some days up there before he went into God's presence. I think acclimatizing uh, so that he wouldn't be incinerated by the glory of God's presence. Nadab and Abihu, they brought in unholy fire. Have you ever seen holy fire or unholy fire? Well, I think I've seen a lot of common fires, so I guess that's the unholy fire. Probably all the fires I've ever made are unholy fires. There is holy fire. What's holy fire? Well, that's the fire that God kindled on the altar in the sanctuary. Can you see a difference when you look at it? I don't think so. Was there a difference? Yes. There was common fire, and there was sacred fire. Nadab and Abihu... Apparently, in the context of the story in Scripture, uh, when afterward God says, don't anybody come in here half drunk anymore? It sounds like they came in there half drunk. And they couldn't tell the difference anymore between holy fire and common fire, so they used common fire. And the fire from God's glory flashed out and destroyed them. Killed them both. Another occasion. 250 princes of Israel say to Moses and Aaron, you guys are taking too much on yourselves. We should be sharing this with you. You're all selfish about the power thing. And uh, we really think you should be sharing that with us. Now, it was them who were selfish and grabby about the power thing, not Moses and Aaron. But they made it sound the other way around. Uh, and uh, they, they insisted on offering incense before the Lord. So they each of the 250 brought an, a censer and offered incense before God. God, God didn't tell them to do that. Didn't authorize them to do that. And fire comes out from God's presence and, and destroys them all. Now, for a long time, I think I read that passage wrongly, not because the words weren't correct, but because I translated them a little differently in my head because I, I think I was avoiding what it actually said. I don't think I knew I was avoiding what it actually said. We're going to turn to Numbers uh, chapter 16. Numbers chapter 16. Pick up in verse 35. And a fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering incense. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Eleazar the son of Aaron the priest to pick up the censers out of the blaze, for they are holy. Scatter the fire some distance away. So he goes in and he picks up the censers. And the censers then are, are dedicated to God. They've been offered by these 250. And God says, So we keep those. And they, they made a cover for the altar 
uh, of burnt sacrifice. I suppose in case of rain or whatever, they've got this bronze cover they can put over that altar now, made out of these 250 uh, censers. Uh, did you notice in verse 37, tell Eliezer the son of Aaron the priest to pick up the censers out of the King James what? Burning. Uh, out of the what? The burning. Uh, in, in the Hebrew, it's saraf. Same root word as uh, seraph, angels, seraphim, the burning ones. Uh, and and uh, he goes into what is still burning, still burning, that just killed 250 men. And he goes in there and picks up the censers. I think I'd have been a little hesitant. A little hesitant. So is this a deadly fire or is this not a deadly fire? Yes, it's both. Absolutely both. It is completely deadly to the 250 who come in there out of harmony with God and his will. But to Eliezer, who goes at God's command, it does nothing. Right? Same fire, right? Same fire. Same fire. Burning bush. Glory of God's presence. That thing's all on fire. And it burns. And it burns. And it burns. And Moses looks back and again, that should be burned up by now. And it's not. That's what got Moses' attention and made him go over. It wasn't the fact that it was flaming. It was the fact that it was burning and never burned up. A bush, a flammable bush, doesn't get consumed by this fire. And yet on Mount Carmel, the fire that God sends can burn what? Rocks. Water. Dirt. And when you're standing on the dirt and the dirt starts burning, I'm backing up. I'm backing up. Because what I'm standing on is burning right there. And you can see the fire line, right? Time to back up. Because things burn with God's fire that are not flammable. And other things don't burn that are supremely flammable. Hmm? Same fire. Same fire does both. So, when Satan and sinners will all be destroyed, it will be that way. It will be that way. The, uh, the wicked are destroyed by that fire. This is from Desire of Ages, page 763 on over to 764. This is not an act of arbitrary power on the part of God. The rejecters of his mercy reap that which they have sown. By a life of rebellion, Satan and all who, who unite with him place themselves so out of harmony with God that his very presence is to them a consuming fire. The glory of him who is love will destroy them. The glory of him who is love will destroy them. Revelation says that the wicked will call for the rocks and mountains to fall on them and hide them from the wrath of the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? Jesus. How much does he hate those wicked who are lost? Remember, the Egyptians are my children, too. He hates them enough to give his life to save them. Actually, he loves them. But they can't see that. They see hostility. They see anger. They see destruction. There is destruction here. All right, now. There is. But it's not because God doesn't love them. It's because they're so far out of harmony with God that it will be to them a destruction, a consuming fire. Again, from Steps to Christ, page 18. The glory of God would be to them a consuming fire. And then in Hebrews 12, 29, our God is a consuming fire. A consuming fire, yes, a consuming fire. Isaiah 33, beginning in verse 14. 
These are the words that the wicked will utter when they see the second coming. Uh, Isaiah 33, beginning in verse 14. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. And watch their words. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? What are they looking at? The glory of God's presence. And what do they call it? A devouring fire. Who among us shall dwell with the everlasting burnings? Ah. Here's the everlasting fire, right? Here's the everlasting fire that's going to destroy the wicked. And they know it's a devouring fire and it will consume them. But they asked a question there. Who will dwell with the devouring fire? Who will dwell with everlasting burnings? And the implied answer in the minds of the wicked is, that's not possible. But the actual answer to their question comes in verse 15, which for a long time I didn't realize was the answer to their question. It's kind of obvious when you see it. Who will dwell with the devouring fire, with the everlasting burnings? He who walks righteously, who speaks uprightly, who despises the gain of oppressions, etc. The righteous. The righteous will dwell with the everlasting burnings. They will dwell with the devouring fire. The wicked won't, but the righteous will. So what they see as a complete impossibility is exactly what's going to happen for God's people. The righteous will. Daniel 3. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar uh, follows through on his threat. If you won't do it, I will burn you alive. Uh, so he has the fire cranked up. Uh, my, my loose translation is, I want to see the outside of that furnace glowing red. That's not quite what he said, but he said, make it seven times hotter than it's supposed to be. Really, really crank that up. How hot was it? What happened to the soldiers who threw them in? Killed instantly. Killed instantly by the fire. What happens to them? What does the fire do to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? No smell. What? Burns the ropes up. It sets them free. Didn't we throw three men bound in there, says the king? Doubting his own sanity, he's so angry he can't believe that he's seeing what he's seeing. And they say, true, O king, we threw three men bound in there. And he says, why does he four men loose? It loosed them. And there's a fourth one. Right? Who are they walking with in that fire? Jesus. They're walking with Jesus in the fire. What happened to the wicked who threw them in? Soldiers? Destroyed by the fire? They're dead. They're dead. In God's presence, uh, uh, Ezekiel, I think it is, Ezekiel 28, talks about the stones of fire. It says of Lucifer, you walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You were in Eden, the garden of God. You've been all these places. You used to walk up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Why are the stones stones of fire? Because they're in God's presence. Why was the burning bush burning? Because it was in God's presence. Why did Moses come out shining brighter than a light bulb? Because he'd been in God's presence. In God's presence, everything glows. Everything comes alight. Rocks are rocks of fire in God's presence. Because of his presence. The stones of fire. The devil, in his innocency as Lucifer, the light bearer, walked up and down in those stones of fire. And the scripture says, you will be destroyed from those Stones of fire. Where is he going to be destroyed? In the same place he used to walk up and down. In God's presence where the stones are on fire because they're in his glorious presence. That's where the devil's going to be destroyed because he will come back into the glorious presence of God. And he cannot survive in that glorious presence because he is not in harmony with God anymore. He will die in the midst of the stones of fire because he can't survive in God's presence anymore. Also notice that this furnace thing here is a little miniature picture of the second coming. 
The fire that destroys the wicked brings God's people into the presence of God and the glory of his presence, walking with Jesus and talking with Jesus. Get it? Second coming in, in, in miniature right there in that fiery furnace. I think that's very cool. It took me a long time to catch that one. Uh, that, that one went by me. I don't know how many, 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 many times I read that story without ever catching that it's, it's got an image of the second coming right there. Malachi chapter 4. Verses 1 to 3. Malachi chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. <clears throat> now there's a pattern here uh, that I, I, I developed my own name for it. I'm sure somebody else has recognized it and has a better name for it. But I got a couple of names for it, either bookends or a sandwich form. In, in a sandwich form, you got the two slices of bread and the filling in the middle. Bookend, you got the two bookends and the book in the middle. So what's the important part? It's what's in the middle, right? But the other pieces are there to hold it all together in a single solitary unit, right? Okay, so here, verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. Now, I always used to jump down to verse 3 because I always went here to talk about the end of the wicked. Verse 3. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. So verse 1 says it's an oven, it's burning, it'll burn them up, leave them neither root nor branch. And verse 3 says they're ashes under the soles of your feet. But that's the bookends. What's the filling in the sandwich on this one? It's verse 2. But to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. You will go out like stall-fed calves. Calves in the springtime, let loose from the barn. They go, even the big cows do that. They jump and they leap. Well, they can't jump as good as calves can. But they're rejoicing that they're out free and it's sunshine, it's warm and it's beautiful and it's not winter anymore. And yay, it's a beautiful day out here. For the righteous coming into the glorious presence of God that is an oven to the wicked is like having a big, beautiful spring sunrise. What's not to like about that? So to the righteous... It's a spring morning. To the wicked, it's ashes. It's ashes. Exposure to God's presence dis blesses the righteous and destroys the wicked. That's the same thing with that sea before God's throne. It's talking about the same basic thing. That sea of glass mingled with fire, it is both. God's glorious presence is the sea of glass to the righteous. It's the lake of fire to the wicked. If we're in harmony with God, we're blessed in his presence. If we are not in harmony with God, we'll be destroyed by his glory. Notice in Daniel 7, the, and I'm actually not going to turn there, but we'll refer to it. There's the, the beginning of the judgment scene. The throne is set up, and it describes the throne. And from his throne flows, in Daniel 7, anybody remember, a fiery stream. So what flows out of God's throne in Daniel 7? A fiery stream. In Revelation 20, 21, what flows out of God's throne? River of life. Do you see a discrepancy? Uh, yeah, until you study fire in scripture. <laughs> and catch that the same sea is the sea of glass or the lake of fire. So also the river is a fiery stream or the river of life. What flows out of God's throne? Yeah, they both do. It's the same thing. Depends on whether we are in harmony with God or not. Whether we experience it as a blessing or a destruction. That's how God's glory is. To those in harmony with him, it is a blessing. To those out of harmony with him, it is a destruction. So, point number two. This is the main point for today. 
The same fire blesses God's people and destroys sinners. That same fire of God's presence blesses God's people and destroys sinners. Now next time, uh, we're going to look at fire in the sanctuary. Uh, learn some more lessons. I hope they are useful to you uh, as they have been to me. Our closing hymn is number 426. I shall see the king. And when we see the king, will we be glad that we see the king or will we be fearful that we see the king? If we're his, we will be glad to see the king. Lord, I thank you for the uh, images in scripture that help us understand that although your glory is a destruction to the wicked, it is a blessing to the righteous. We look forward to seeing you in your glory, in your kingdom, and stand before you on the sea of glass. In Jesus' name, amen.